All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I have uh, two o'clock, two o one here on my uh, clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us on this month's edition of The Current, the North Central Region Water Network Speed Networking Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Ann Nardi, and I'll be the facilitator for today's session. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, the North Central Region Water Network is a 12 state extension led collaboration of uh, extension professionals and partners who are working to ensure safe and sufficient water supplies across the North Central Region. Uh, we do host this month, this webinar uh, monthly on a variety of different water subjects. Uh, we call it a speed networking webinar series as we feature uh, the leading researchers and outreach professionals on different water related topics and let them share just a little bit of information on their work, uh, let you know what's going on in different parts of the region and um, give you a glimpse uh, into uh, some of their research. So today's topic is going to be uh, water quality and wetland mapping. Very excited to have two great speakers set up for you today. Um, mapping is something that we've uh, long thought about in uh, water resource management. Where are the hot spots? Where can we see where water quality or where uh, shoreline or wetland ecosystems are uh, strong and where they might be uh, uh, a hot spot for uh, nutrients um, as just a couple examples. So we're gonna be uh, highlighting two specific projects um, that are working on mapping water quality in Minnesota and mapping the Great Lakes uh, wetlands in terms of type and extent. So very excited to have uh, that as our topic for today. A couple um, logistical things for you, housekeeping things for you before we get started. Uh, so we will have two speakers today and then we will have a Q&A afterwards. Uh, please submit all your questions in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will have the Q&A following both of the speakers. Um, and we also have the opportunity for you to upvote other folks' questions. So if someone asked a question that you think is really relevant to your work, please upvote it. We'll get to those questions that are the most popular first and kind of work our way down from there. Um, if you are experiencing any technical issues or if you'd like to say hi to the fellow folks that are on the webinar today or share any relevant links or information, the chat is really the best avenue to do that. Uh, we ask that you not put the questions for our speakers in the chat because they can often get lost. So questions for the speakers in the Q&A, but feel free to chat um, and share resources in the chat feature. Also, if you're having any audio issues, there is an option to use your phone as an audio. You can do that by clicking the up arrow on the mute button and then uh, click switch to phone audio. And this session will be recorded. The slides will also be made available and both of those will be on our website at northcentralwater.org following today's session. All right. Let's get started. I mentioned we have two uh, really great speakers that I'm excited to feature today. Uh, the first one is uh, Leif Manson, and he is from the University of Minnesota, and he's going to be talking about using satellite derived water quality data to really prone or really determine the water quality throughout the state of Minnesota, and then hopefully uh, determine those trends in those lakes that may be prone to uh, cyanobacterial blooms. Uh, we also have Laura Boya Chavez, uh, who is a senior research scientist and adjunct assistant professor at Michigan uh, Tech Research Institute and in Michigan. Uh, and Michigan Tech. And she's gonna be talking about some of the high resolution imagery that she's using to really monitor and map Great Lakes coastal wetlands and their extent type and hydro period. So with that, we will get started. Uh, uh, Dr. Almanson is up first. Um, you can read his bio on the screen here and talk a little bit about um, his experience uh, working at the University of Minnesota, as well as some of his research interests um, and so, Leaf, we're very excited that you could be here. We know that you were featured on our Harmful Algal Bloom Symposium um, earlier this year and excited to share the work with another group of um, water professionals with us today. Okay. I'll stop sharing and hand it off to you. Okay. Um, let's see, I'll share the screen first. Share. Okay. Timer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to talk about the work I've been doing using satellite remote sensing for water quality assessments in Minnesota. 
and more specifically how we've automated the image processing procedures with a you know, high performance computing environment and how we can use the data to identify trends and lakes prone to cyanobacteria blooms. Um, the, the high performance computing uh, work was, uh, was with the collaboration with the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute and specifically David Porter. So what we've been doing uh, in our past ones, we basically take uh, secundus measurements from citizen volunteers. And uh, at the same time, we have uh, satellites regularly collecting imagery. So what we do is we find good, clear, late summer uh, imagery, link that up with the water quality data within a few dates of the image, do that for, uh, and then we take that, uh, those, we build a relationship of the, um, a statistical model of the relationship, apply that model to all the lakes on an image, do that for enough images, we come up with the water quality for the whole state. So using those methodologies, we've completed nine statewide assessments since 1975, uh, 2000, um, actually 10,000 plus lakes. So we have uh, quite a few lakes in Minnesota. Uh, these are at around five year intervals due to the, um, the, the Availability of clear imagery for one thing is Landsat was only every 16 days. And then the other thing is uh, just it takes a long time to, to process these images manually. We use that for analysis, spatial and temporal trends, the causal factors. Uh, one unique thing we did back in 2002 is we made all of our data available on a lake browser. Uh, it's an online resource. Uh, allows you to um, look at your, your get information about your lakes, thousand unique visitors monthly. And recently that was updated with the data from our automated system uh, with the help of uh, Peter Waringa from the U Spatial at the University of Minnesota. So we have all these great new satellites. We have higher spatial, spectral, radiometric, and temporal resolution. So not only can we map water clarity, we can also map the factors that control water clarity, things like phytoplankton, suspended solids, and dissolved organic color. So it's the, the spectral characteristics of the satellite allow it to measure different water quality variables better than others. And uh, so if we look at the, the spectral bands down here of the satellites, uh, here's some characteristic reflectance spectra. Uh, with Landsat, uh, we're miss missing one key band, this red edge band at uh, peak at 705. Um, another key band is the one at 620 for phycocyanin. Uh, so that would be an indicator of cyanobacteria blooms. Um, so with the Landsat, we're missing that band. So Landsat is really great for water clarity and also for color dissolved organic matter, which is the, the brown stuff in water. And here's kind of some examples of that down here. Um, with the Sentinel-2, we have that red edge band. So very important uh, advancement. Uh, for monitoring chlorophyll. Um, and then if you go to the Sentinel-3, we actually have a lot more spectral bands, and inclu including uh, 620 bands. So that would be a, a good band for doing uh, phycocyanin or identifying chlor or cyanobacteria in our waters. So one important advanced other uh, option that Lion's Head has is thermal bands. So you can actually measure temperature, and that goes back to the mid-80s. So we have lots of Nice temperature data that could be utilized as well. Um, the next big advancement for satellites will be Landsat Next. Uh, that's expected around 2030. Uh, so this is in the works right now. Um, it's a hybrid triplets. So they're gonna have three different satellites. And it, for the first time, is actually designed for user needs. They actually asked the users how, what they wanted, including we would, went to workshops and you know, what factors you wanted in the uh, uh, characteristics you in, the, in the imagery. And uh, they're basically filling all those needs. So it's a kind of a big advancement for remote sensing. Um, unfortunately, it is seven years out, so it's gonna be a little while. Um, Landsat Next, or Landsat 9 was launched last year. And unfortunately, they basically a clone of Landsat. Uh, eight, so it's really basically no big advances there, but with Landsat Next, it'll be a big advance. The big advances right now are with Sentinel-2 with that red edge band, and then the temporal coverage. So we have to do with what we got available. And so by utilizing Landsat and Sentinel-2 right now, we're able to um, get some pretty good coverage of imagery. Here's an example of the Sentinel-2 
two. And uh, you can see there's uh, quite a few clouds in the imagery. And uh, that is kind of typical for more Northern Minnesota, Minnesota, you know, specifically in the Midwest. So, so it's something you have to deal with, very difficult to deal with uh, manually. This is the kind of imagery I like for, for manual image processing. You can process lots of lakes really quickly. Once you get the, the clouds in there, it gets very difficult. We can uh, deal with that with our automated procedures. Uh, we have, uh, for the first time, we have opportunity for near real time water quality monitoring with all these satellites. So we have uh, satellite data coming in, downloaded to the ground stations. Uh, from there, we can get a machine to machine, machine access into the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute. And then from there, we can start working our magic on the imagery. Uh, we have uh, things like atmosphere correction and then different masks to remove off affected pixels that could cause erroneous results. So atmosphere correction is basically removing the effects from the atmosphere to what you would expect it to be on the ground. There's lots of different atmosphere corrections out there. We tested eight of them and uh, found uh, a few that work much better than the rest. And uh, the one we're using is actually Maine. It's, uh, it harmonizes Sentinel-2 with Landsat band. So uh, that's very useful. Uh, plus uh, it, uh, it, was, uh, um, it, it works well in an automated system where some of the others have lookup tables, which just makes it very difficult. So we use the uh, Maine, uh, which is uh, ben Benjamin Pages. Uh, atmospheric correction is used currently at the USGS. Um, the other thing is cloud masking. We start with uh, FMAS4, which is a common cloud mask. And uh, from there, we have to actually buffer it because there's lots of artifacts left over from that. The, the cloud mask is designed for land. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work that well for water alone. So we start with uh, buffering it. And then uh, from there, we actually have to do additional mass too. So once we get all those mass, we're left with uh, almost clear pixels. But when we started processing all of our data, we found we had some anomalies once in a while. And once we started looking into it, we found out we had wildfire smoke. So wildfire smoke has different characteristics than aerosols from uh, moisture. So uh, we had to do something different. So we actually came up with a uh, wildfire smoke mask as well. Okay, from there, uh, now we have just clear pixels. We can make some water quality models. To do that, the way we do it is we actually take all available clear imagery, link it to all available in situ data, and then uh, use that for model development. Here's some examples of that. This is uh, 2017 to 2020. We have about 20,000 uh, secudus measurements for Minnesota. Uh, we're currently in the process of increasing that data set to 2021, 2020 to and Wisconsin, Michigan, and other parts around the country. So we'll have a lot more data. Um, the multi-linear regression works well, uh, especially for the clarity. Uh, we found that machine learning is a significant improvement, so that's the way we'll be going for our, our next iteration of models. Um, this is especially important with chlorophyll, since uh, chlorophyll does not work very well for the really the lower chlorophyll values. Uh, so once you get the really low, it, it kind of overestimates chlorophyll. And uh, so the machine learning actually improves that quite, quite a bit. So we have some models. We can apply it to the imagery and make some maps. And, uh, and then we can put it in our lake browser. Uh, the data we have created is chlorophyll, clarity, and CDOM. Uh, so the way we've been doing it is every clear image occurrence, we get uh, daily data uh, when the imagery is there at the lake level. So we basically compile that in a, a spreadsheet, a CSV file. And then uh, for our monthly, for our pixel level, we do monthly mosaics. So, uh, you know, there's always, uh, you know, if you take one image, there's always gonna be gaps for parts of the states, but if we compile them all together, we usually get pretty good coverage throughout the whole state. Now, here's some example of the monthly data. Uh, this is the pixel level. And I'm just gonna run through here. Uh, we have uh, taking a look at this red dot that shows up right there. Now, this is a fairly pristine area. I mean, Lake of the Woods and Upper and Lower Red have some activity going on for blooms and things. But for this area, it's pre pretty pristine. Uh, so, we're, you know, seeing that red dot, we can look at the imagery and actually identify yes, there's a bloom in that area. So you can see what's going on. Um, you know, it's kind of find the needle in the haystack for that one. 
a little bit more dynamic area would be the Twin City metropolitan area. And this area is, you know, the metro area here, the red. So this is kind of for, you know, reference to what's going on. So this is the Twin City developed areas and then the agricultural areas of the yellow stuff around it. So here's uh, 2017 through 2022. And uh, we have, uh, starting out 2017, it was just getting operating. So it was late to 2017 is when the Sentinel-2 was in full operation. So it's pretty good coverage most of the time after that. So we have uh, good coverage. One thing you'll notice in the late summer period, uh, we have a lot of blooms and a lot of egg lakes in the agricultural areas. So pretty consistent pattern, same lakes are getting green every year. And uh, that can be identified pretty quickly uh, with this bird's eye view of the data that we have. So if we go to the lake level, uh, this is the number of lake points for one year. This is 2019. This is Lake Francis, a more of a mesotrophic lake. Uh, so far we have uh, about 3 million measurements uh, for Minnesota. Uh, we have, uh, so this is mesotrophic lake, Tatanka, Washington, Sakata, and German are more eutrophic lakes. And then uh, Elysian would be a hyper-eutrophic lake. We do that for a number of years. You can see that different years have different, you know, water quality conditions for different lakes. And so it's not one lake is always bad or, you know, kind of change around a little bit depending on what's going on in the watershed and in the uh, climatic factors. So having a uh, sampling one year might not pick up everything you want to pick up. So having lots of data is very useful in identifying these patterns. Um, for our spatial and temporal analysis, we basically used the, our historical assessments we created, and then we basically added our newer data and basically just calculated the late summer index period for that. And if we look at our trends, what we found is we had Trends in about 20% of our lakes, and that was a change of 10, uh, 10 or more uh, TSI units, which would be equivalent of a doubling or halving of algal biomass or doubling the halving of the disc measurement. And so we'd have uh, about 14% had increase in water clarity, and about 6% had decrease. And so they are going in the right direction for the most part. If we take a smaller slice, five to 10 TSI units, 18% increasing, and about eight. 0.6% decreasing. If we take a look around this on the different ecoregions, we find that in the agricultural areas, there's a higher percentage of decrease in water clarity than improving uh, than the rest of the state. Um, and then let's see, we got uh, some hot spots. Uh, this spot up here, uh, we have a little bit of prairie potholes. It's kind of get a wetter period. And so we've kind of moved into a wetter period. So a lot of the prairie potholes are filling up. But there's also been a change in agricultural practices that's gone from small grain to mostly soybeans and corn. And so that uh, could impact more intensive agricultural practices. Uh, the metro area that we see a lot of improving in water quality, um, probably due to uh, using best management practices when areas are developed. And uh, like in my neighborhood where they're putting a lot of rain gardens in and stuff to improve the water quality. Um, with the uh, one thing that's concerned for me up in northern Minnesota, there's a lot of lakes that are changing. And uh, these are kind of the smaller, shallower waters. And so it, it seems to me that it's probably a, a climate factor. Um, northern Minnesota is one of the fastest warming places in the USA. So uh, in uh, Minnesota overall, about three three degree increase in temperature over this period um, during the late summer. Um, and also a little bit larger swings in the precipitation events. So we can look at the distribution uh, through Minnesota, in the different ecoregions. We have the Northern Lakes and Forest, Lakes, uh, Wetlands and Forest. And you see more water quality, more targeted at the, the higher end here, the better water clarity. Uh, North Central Hardwood Forest, more of a mixed bag. That's kind of, you know, mixed water quality as well. And when you get to the agricultural area down here, you know, more into the lower water clarity classes. Let's take a look at the uh, lake browser here. So we have a new lake browser. Let's see, okay, good, it's in the right spot. 
Okay, we can zoom around the state and uh, look at different areas. Let's go about right there. Okay, so here you can change to pixel level or lake level. So I'm gonna go to chlorophyll, lake level. And then this is from May. So you can see there's already a few lakes that are blooming here. June, we have a few more. July, we're missing a few lakes because of cloud cover for that, that month. Um, here's August, a few more blooms. September, and then October, lots of blooms. So a little bit uh, senescing at the end for some of the lakes. Uh, we can zoom into any specific lake that we want, um, all the lakes and get a full report. So we'll just click on Lake Minnetonka, which is kind of a popular lake. Um, it's got an improving water clarity trend. I can see the seasonal component, higher clarity in the early year and less so in the late summer, but still not bad. We have the tabular data, and then we have the daily data as well. So here we have clarity, chlorophyll, and CDOM. And uh, you can see all the, the measurements. There's quite a few of them and uh, very useful for if you're doing uh, some you know, detailed studies. We rank the lakes by different uh, delineations like statewide or county or ecoregion or watershed. And you can see like statewide, this is in the 74 percentile. So it's clearer than 74% of the lakes in the state. And then we have the chlorophyll, seasonal data, and the tabular data, um, CDOM, and then some land cover stuff. So you can get kind of a picture of what's going on in the lake. And I'm just gonna check that. And we got uh, also working on uh, uh, Michigan and Wisconsin. Uh, we have, uh, Currently with the, these combined uh, about over 21,000 uh, lakes in this data set. Uh, we have 2021 20, and uh, 2022 completed or just preliminary ones for those two right now. Uh, and here's just some of the statistics for that. Uh, Minnesota, we have about twice as many lakes as uh, Wisconsin and Michigan. If you're uh, counting uh, the same, the same uh, size lakes, uh, but we have a higher percentage of more eutrophic lakes, lower clarity lakes uh, than Wisconsin or Michigan. And we don't have as many of the, the very highest clarity lakes in our in Minnesota. So that's something I'm interested in looking into further what's going on with that. We look at just the ecoregion, uh, the Northern Lakes and Forests. Uh, basically we have, you know, good water quality, you know, we don't have the, a lot of eutrophic lakes up there in Minnesota, uh, but we still have less of the really clear lakes in Minnesota than Wisconsin or Michigan. Uh, we're also interested in looking at other areas, things like the reservoirs uh, down in southern states. And so we're gathering data from around the country. If anyone has data, contact me and I'll see if we can get it into our system. Uh, with that, I think I kind of fit into time. <laughs> So that's great. That's, Thank you so much, Leif. I really appreciate it. Sure. Um, lots of qu great questions uh, coming in. We're going to hold our questions until after our second presentation. So uh, Leif, if you wouldn't mind stopping sharing for a second. Yep. All right, great. So uh, next up, we're excited to have uh, Laura Boyo Chavez with us today. Um, so we're going to be changing direction from water quality to talk wetlands and monitoring wetlands using high resolution data uh, imagery, excuse me. Um, so very excited to have um, Dr. Boyo Chavez here. Um, she is a, a senior research scientist with Michigan Tech Research Institute and an assistant professor at Michigan Technology Tech University. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you. I'll stop sharing and hand it over to you. Okay. Okay, you seeing it in presentation mode? Looks great. Okay. So I'm I'm gonna um, be talking about 
some work we've been doing with high resolution imagery for monitoring Great Lakes coastal wetlands, both the extent type and the hydro period. Um, so I'm going to start why we need to monitor coastal wetlands with high res data and, and how these products got developed. Um, a little bit about the binational project that um, funded this both with Canada and the US and that team um, is currently called the Great Lakes Alliance for Remote Sensing or GLARS and there's a website glars.org where you can get data. There, it, there are links there to a, um, a data portal. Um, so I'm going to go over where the pilot study areas were, where we prototyped products, and then the products I'm going to go over are highlighted here in black. Um, there are some other ones too beyond this list, but the other one that we have done is the wetland change approaches. I'm looking at connectivity modeling. I'm not going to have time for that. Um, and then the digital surface models that share geo do from the worldview serial pair. Sometimes we incorporate those into our mapping. Um, and then there's some slides at the end about how to learn more about the project and products. We have like a story map that I have a link to and I can put them in the chat too. So this is showing Landsat data from 1984 um, to 2018. And you can see the changes that are occurring on the coastline and the, as the wetlands are expanding. A lot of this is invasive plants. Um, and so over this time period, changes in lake levels have allowed wetlands to expand during low water periods, and then they shrink um, during high water periods, and as well as this area uh, is about from the, the shore in out to the water's edge is about 850 to 1000 meters. And a lot of it is Phragmites, which I'll show you a little later. Um, and so very, really small changes in the hydrology lead to large shifts in the ecosystems. Um, and so monitoring wetland gain and loss um, is kind of tricky because the wetlands are shifting um, with lake level changes. So we've lost over 50% of the Great Lakes coastal wetlands um, since the Industrial Revolution. And the remaining wetlands are really at risk um, to land development invasive species. And so monitoring changes are really important for management and decision making. So the two sensors that we use, they're very complementary. There's Worldview 2, which is submeter. And um, as Leaf was saying, there's issues with cloud cover. So we don't get a whole lot of this um, imagery over the Great Lakes in particular. Um, but this is, it's an eight band data and, and it does have the red edge. Um, and this is showing here just a natural color composite. So what you would see with your eye of the Bad River area. And then on the bottom is the radar sat two, um, which is a Canadian C-band radar, um, which C-band is about 5.7 centimeter wavelength. So much longer than what you see with your eye. Um, and so it picks up different things. It's picking up inundation, water level patterns, but also the structure of the vegetation. Um, whereas the optical data is really dependent upon the reflectance at the leaf cellular level in the vegetation. So leaf color and density of the leaves. And you can pick up water um, underneath the canopy if it's sparse enough. So they're really complementary to each other for mapping. And we typically use multiple dates of each if we can. That's, that's the ideal method of mapping. And so why do we need high resolution? So combining radar set two with worldview, we get five meter resolution. If we use worldview alone, it's sub meter. But you can see the difference here between um, a map made with 30, 20 to 30 meter resolution data in 2010. And the distinction of these sometimes thin, uh, different wetland types is, is more difficult. Of course, there is 10, a six year difference between these two. But you can see the level of detail that you're getting. Um, and some of the wetlands are really um, hard to see in the coarser resolution data. So a little bit about this project, um, or GLARS. Um, so it began in 2016 with a, a collaboration between um, Natural Resources Canada, Environment Canada, Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and they funded through the GLRI and the US side, University of Minnesota Shared Geo and Michigan Tech. So the goal of this was to build an integrated ongoing remote sensing program for mapping and monitoring. We started with these um, pilot areas 
and the idea was to try to work on building um, building operational or you know um, assist, uh, or operational um, steps that we could just um, apply to future data, um, looking at both X, Y, and Z um, in space and then times to make it a 4D monitoring system. And so these are some of the products using the radar and optical imagery. Um, we did um, the wetland type and extent, invasive species, the surface water extent monitoring, um, that would be non-vegetated and then the inundated inundation extent under vegetation. Water level changes was pretty much being done by um, NR Canada and then uh, digital surface models and canopy height changes is a product you can get um, on the website. Um, Shared Geo produced that. Um, and then we, we looked at application to um, updating NWI and ha assessing habitat, as well as monitoring well and gain and loss. So these were the, um, the study areas, the pilot study areas. Originally, it was Duluth, um, Lake St. Clair, and then a couple in, um, in Canada. Um, so the, the, these are the US ones that we've been monitoring through time. So I'm gonna start with the ecotype mapping, including the invasive plant Phragmites. If any of you are familiar with that, um, it's been uh, problematic, especially in the Southern parts of the Great Lakes, um, can grow up to uh, 15 feet tall. So for all of the mapping, we've been using random forests as a machine learning classifier. Um, typically, we like to have spring, summer, and fall data that's optimal from, from both radar and optical data. And then we use field data and air photo interpretation to create training polygons to make the supervised data, which go in with the image layer stack into random forests to get out our classified image. Um, we do, in some cases, use less than spring, summer, fall because of what's available, especially for the optical data. Um, and, and in fact, we are able to use just a single optical image because of the high res and especially for mapping. We just mask out some of the non-coastal wetland areas um, that would be um, confused. So these are the wetland types that we've been mapping. We can map um, monocultures of cattail and Phragmites as well as Xenoplectus, um, and then uh, emergent uh, mixed vegetation, wet meadows, and floating aquatic. So here's an example of a map from Lachino Islands in Lake Huron. Um, this is uh, near Mackinac Island. Um, and with each one of these maps, this is one of the ones I showed you a zoom in of um, earlier. Um, we have an accuracy assessment. So these are all available on that um, portal. And also on our, we have a web viewer that runs through our story map. So we all have the total accuracy here, it was 84%. And then for the individual classes, you can get the producers and users accuracy. And a lot of times the confusion is between wetland classes. For example, Sheena Plectus here is confused with aquatic bed and it's very sparse. So that kind of makes sense um, that those two would be confused. We also get some confusion with agriculture. Um, and that has to do, especially when we're using radar, because you, um, what we're relying on is a double bounce from what we call a double bounce, um, where a lot of energy is coming back because it's hitting the water, the vegetation, and coming back very strong. But that occurs also um, due to the row structure in agriculture. Here's another example uh, from 2019 of the St. Louis River estuary. And there is no whole lot of Phragmites here. Um, we went out with the 1854 Treaty Authority in 2017, and they took us to every single location in that year that they knew of where there was Phragmites, and they were like taking care of it right away. So it, it, that's nice that they're um, they're doing that. We were able, um, not, um, unfortunately, there was some that popped up. You can see um, uh, in this. Uh, the worldview image here, this um, kind of gray green area, that's what Phragmites looks like, is very easy to map. And in all of these maps, the colors are the same. Phragmites is the dark purple, and the typha is pink, and the emergent wetlands blue. 
um, and that this had one date of worldview because often we will we weren't getting any worldview um, just too cloudy and three dates of radar sat spring summer and fall so these are the number of maps that we were able to produce so far from these areas we like to have field data and and that was got kind of difficult especially with covid um, but these are the years of the maps and those are all available on the portal and the web viewer um, when we have more than one year we're then able to look at change and so this is whitefish point um, and you can see a change it looks like even though the lake levels were going up between these two years the water appears to be getting drier the site appears to be getting drier it's probably not connected to the the great lakes then um, when we can see like an increase um, from the light blue which is floating aquatic to emergent so the when the water levels go down the emergent takes goes in where the aquatic bed was um, and these had 2017 overall accuracy 82 percent 2019 75 percent and we were at able to go visit this location um, in those two years. And notice there is a limitation of penetration with this 5.7 centimeter C-band radar. It cannot really can well penetrate um, shrub or forest, especially if it's dense. But there's a lot of peatlands here, which um, those are generally sparse canopy. So then I wanted to talk a little bit about the invasive species monitoring for restoration and management. And here I'm focusing on Phragmites. We've done a lot of work in Saginaw Bay, so I'm just going to highlight that area. Um, under um, EPA funding, we actually mapped the whole coastal area from 2016 worldview data, and that's available on our web viewer. Um, and then there's a you can request to download it at that site, and it'll send me an email, and I'll tell you where to get it. Um, there's also on that site, the 30 meter resolution Great Lakes map that we produce from um, the, the quarter resolution data. And that actually is beyond the coastal zone now, it's the entire basin. And there's metadata available that will come with the data when you get it. So zooming in on these two locations, there's been treatment that occurred um, with collaborations with uh, uh, Saginaw Bay Sisma there, or the um, collaborative invasive species management area is what it is, and they they coordinate um, for the region um, getting uh, Phragmites being controlled. So here, this is actually the Zawaki Bridge here. If anybody, if you, any of you have driven through Michigan, and this area um, had Phragmites along in several patches along it, and then we were able to through this map um, inform the SISMA that and then they were able to get bids out for area amount of area that needed treatment and where exactly it was it looks like they must have missed some so um, this is the post treatment over here and when it's gray that means it's standing dead um, but there's still quite a bit in this location um, and so using this second map they went out um, and treated it again same thing here this is right along the coast and this is the area where the water levels dropped in lake huron and greg mighty just took over um, a lot of the area but if you look at the map there's actually also um cattail and some other you know wet meadow some other um, types in there that you don't really want to treat and so it's important to map it um, and then this is the post treatment map here um, then they came in and mowed it. Oh, these are a couple of spots where the frag was missed. Um, they came in and mowed it in the winter of 2018. So this is what the image looked like um, then. And here's the one of the transects that I have some photos from. Um, this is what it looked like before. Very, very, very dense, very difficult to walk through. Um, and we went out in August, and, and a lot of this had been washed away um, and so this is what it looked like looking from this transect back over towards this tree line here um, and you can see the dead standing right there 
Um, so doing this, we were, were able to also calculate the effectiveness of the treatment or the change in Phragmites. Um, so we have the percent of the area. These are different sites. Dutch Creek is the first one I showed you. So it had 19.8% of the area was Phragmites in 2016 and 5.4 in 2018 for 73% change. Um, some of the other ones we got really good. This was actually a really tiny site um, and 100% uh, effectiveness in some of them. Uh, the Callahan was a problem area. We continue to treat that one. It's an old farm field that we think is problematic. Maybe the Phragmites um, is, is, is not as sensitive there to the um, mazapir and, uh, um, and the other chemicals that are being used. So that one we continue to monitor. So after, you know, from, from the maps that we create, we're able to determine where we can do helicopter spraying and green, where you need um, backpack spot treatment. The yellow is um, a treatment that would occur along the shoreline where there's trees so that the helicopter doesn't kill the trees. Um, and so that informs the management. So we've continued um, with a Sogo grant, um, which for the first time allowed us to retreat areas, which some a lot of the funding has only been new treatment areas. So we're able to continue to monitor these areas um, near Hampton and, and, um, and then uh, this one was partially treated at the end of that first grant that the EPA funded. Um, and so we were able to go back and treat all of these red areas. This is our problem area, that Callahan Road one. And then post-treatment, we went from 401 acres of Phragmites here to 26 and a half um, in this case. And um, part of this is, is mowing the or burning the dense standing frag. Um, so we're able to look at this one site that we've been treating since 2016 to see how it's changing. Uh, and as, as Phragmites pops up, they're able to treat it. So there's a, like a little spot here that then they treated this past fall. And there's a little bit in, um, in some of the, in mixed in with some of the cattail. So if you, if you zoom in, you can see it better. So here's a, a zoom in, um, the purple here is, is the frag. There's mixed frag um, in the, the um, lighter purple in this case. Um, and this is after the treatment. So you can see there's some frag that got missed out here. So they'll go back in and hand spray that. Um, and I was excited about a new, new uh, funded project again for Sogol that will be starting soon where we're taking our the red zone here and getting all the areas that have propagule pressure of um, Phragmites along the edges of that, as well as this whole area down the Quantica Sea and up um, the west, the eastern side of the bay. So the last thing is the inundation monitoring with the radar. And for that, we've automated it. Um, so it can be um, done operationally. Here, we just use the HV backscatter, which is one of the bands from RadarSat um, too. It has, has four polarized, polarized um, channels. And it's just a automated thresholding between land and water. So you get this threshold and then to produce this land versus water where the green is land and the blue is water here. We first do a segmenting to, um, which is object-based, which is also a open source, this slick algorithm. And so it's all open source, runs in Python. Um, and um, this helps delineate the shoreline better. So you don't have the choppy pixels. And then we filter it because anything with a smooth surface, like if there was a runway in there would also show up as water. Um, and so we filter with a impervious surface mask to, to get rid of those artifacts. Um, so here's Bad River looking at, um, so I forgot to tell you. So the flooded vegetation is done in a similar way, but it uses um, a, a polarimetric parameter called Shannon entropy. Um, or sometimes we use a ratio of bands to get the green on here. 
So that's on May 18, 2017. This is what was inundated vegetation. The blue was open water. And then this is July, August, October. And then if we put them all together, we can get sort of a hydro period for 2017. So we have 11 images from that. And so this is showing how many times it was inundated. Um, and the open water um, is, is the solid blue and then yellow is never inundated, it's, it's a zero. And then the inundated areas are various um, shades of, of green and to blue. So looking at that in, this is Harsons Island and Wapole Island on the Canadian side. This is um, Canada and the US in um, Lake St. Clair. So if we look at this, we can doing that same thing, looking at the hydro period for 2016, as the lake levels rose um, 2017, you can see it getting wetter, bluer or wetter. And so they're really affecting that hydro period. And this, this we've linked this um, change in hydro period to water or black turn habitat that, that was disappearing here because the lake levels were increasing. And, and we can see the changes in the vegetation also. So we have a total of 390 inundation products because every time we got a radar sat two image, we created one, it's automated process. Um, and there are a few other areas besides the pilot, like there's a Rochester, New York one. Um, there are just a couple of places beyond those original ones that data were collected. So we made maps and these are available on the portal. So this is the project website. Actually, I can put these in the chat. Um, the GLARS website where there's links there to get to the data portal. Oh, um, this is our project website. And I think there's links between these two and then our story map, which also is linked um, from there, but it can be hard to find. So I'll put it in the chat. And if there are um, any questions um, about that, I can answer them. So. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. All right, great. Well, we have quite a few questions in the chat. So uh, we will uh, get started at answering a few of these. I do think folks were probably only going to get to those questions that are the most popular here. So I'll try to ask those with the most upvotes. Um, and I will provide uh, Leaf and Laura's email address afterwards if you have a burning question that um, we aren't have time for today. So uh, thank you so much. I, I just want to jump in. The first question is for Leaf. Um, Dr. Olmanson, can your satellite cameras tell the difference in chlorophyll from algae and from floating plants like duckweed? Yes, yes, that was one of the mass we use, uh, mass off the aquatic plants and duckweed would be part of the aquatic plants. Wonderful. And what machine learning algorithms are you using? Uh, we're, um, methods I use is uh, random forest. Uh, David Porter, for a lot of the masks we've been using, he's been using other methods, machine learning methods. And uh, we're kind of, he doesn't like the, the output I have in my software to, to put in the automated system. So we're trying some, uh, uh, random forest in the, the MSI supercomputer system. So hopefully that'll give us a better output. So that's that and his other methods, we're gonna try a bunch of different methods and find out what works best. All right, great, thank you. Uh, um, Laura, a question from Leland. What treatments are used for Phragmites control? Um, so typically, They've been using glyphosate. Gly did I say that right? Gly <laughs> and, um, they typically use that alone, but um, like that one site, uh, Callahan Road, it was the last couple of times they used a mixture of that with the mazapir, and then there's a surfactant. Okay, all right. And I do know um, folks are want to have a question in the chat. 
for a link to the portal that you mentioned. I did put a link to the um, glars.org. Is that the portal by chance, Laura? I think that's folks how are just you get to, to the get portal. It. So you have to you have to go there and then you have to register. And then if you register, then you get to the portal. Um, oh, I do see that you put it in um, here. That's wonderful. And I think that had to do with the the digital surface model data. It's, it, I don't think it's available to everyone yet, or it might be. I know it got finally got approved. Um, there was um, a sale of the satellite, and the new the people that bought it realized that they could make money on the digital surface model. <laughs> And so they they put a stop to sharing it, but um, and anyway, they, it had to go through a lot of a lot of hoops to get it approved to share with everyone. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thank you. I do see now that you put the the links to there and the links to the guards.org. Um, maybe I'm not saying the acronym correctly. Um, uh, website there where folks can go to sign up for the portal. Uh, Leaf, we actually have two questions that are related to the size of lakes that can be detected using your satellite or the depth of lakes, you know, what, what classifies as a lake um, at using your data. Yeah, so for um, our polygons go down to 10 acres, so we don't use polygons lower than that, uh, but we do at the pixel level there, you know, down to five acres can probably be seen depending on the shape of the lake. So, um, with, especially with the Sentinel-2 20 meter data. So that's, yeah, it's pretty small legs. Yeah, <laughs> understood. And kind of a follow-up to that, um, are the lakes uh, that are predominantly agricultural reasons experiencing the blooms, and maybe this would be a, you know, your your best guess at it is you know because of high levels of nutrients or because they're above the threshold for carp i haven't heard it asked that way before yeah i think uh, there's yeah there's a lot of carp problems in a lot of the lakes and uh, that causes a lot of blooms so they're both <laughs> probably a good way of identifying lakes that are prone to carp are looking at the ones that have a lot of blooms in the early earlier time of the year right right okay wonderful uh, and then a question for Laura. Laura, what is the cost of the radar? Are you saying maybe with the last that it's not a cost at the moment for the public to view? So the the cost of the we didn't have a cost um, for the radar set too. That was uh, through NGA. It was provide. It, you can get it as any federal agency. You can get access to it. And so since we were funded by the Fish and Wildlife, we were we got free access to it. But I think one. One image is like five thousand dollars, you know, typically. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> um, and Leaf, a question for you from Elizabeth Smith: Does the spatial and temporal resolution of your process data allow you to see the effects of precipitation and wind on blooms? Yeah. The the well, like like the example I think I showed with the the reservoir, you can see the the plumes coming in, um, you know, you're going to be getting, you know, so five days, every five days, maybe if, if you're, if it's a clear period of time. So if you can see it in the wind, you can probably, for Lake of the Woods is always a pretty dynamic place because that's got the blooms that are moving all around and you can see some squirrels, but you're never, you're not going to have, with remote sensing, you're not, you're not going to have, you know, the whole every single day or something because it's way too many clouds and but we are moving to higher temporal resolution with the with the European Space Agency and NASA, USGS are doing. There will be probably daily imagery available, but still with the cloud cover, you still can't see the through the clouds. And the radar doesn't pick up the bloom, so it's not going to help. Yeah, understood. Understood. Uh, Laura, a question for you. Um, folks are interested in learning a little bit more about the field data collection that you're doing for the mapping, and if that's described in detail somewhere, because it seems different than transect sampling. Is that correct? It is, because it's done specifically for scaling up to the satellite. And so we do our minimum mapping resolution. Uh, that's what we sample on the ground. And um, so it's we actually on that, I don't have the website linked here. I can actually put it there, but the 
our website that I showed the map of Saginaw Bay and told you that we had a Great Lakes Basin map, that site has a link to our field data. You, you can request our field data as well. I think you can display it on that map too to see where it is. And I've actually shared that with several people who have used it in their mapping. Um, and those are typically 40 by 50 meter size um, plots that we characterize the vegetation within that. And that way we can scale that up. If you just know where one Phragmite strand is and you don't know how many are around it, that you can't scale that up. You, know, you have to know the minimum area that's being mapped. What is the dominant vegetation in order to train the classifier? Right, okay, great. Yeah, and another question um, that kind of came out of that is how do you factor in the accuracy? I know you were showing the accuracy score there. You know, are you factoring that in for management or does it just give you an idea of how reliable your results are overall? Um, so you don't know where the errors, I mean, typically when we make a map, we look at it to not just look at the accuracy, but look at the map to see if it makes sense. I mean, you can have really high accuracy and have a really bad map <laughs> just based on where that training data or validation data was. And so what, what we do is we reserve 20% of the field data. And we use actual field data for that, not um, air photo interpretation as the validation. And so that's what goes into that table. And that um, you can, um, there's some different things you can do as far as um, applying that if you're doing something like uh, we're doing carbon stocks in peatlands. And so you can um, use your accuracy table to determine um, like a confidence interval, but as any map has an, an accuracy and it's going to have areas where it's, you know, false positives, and false negatives. So it just gives you an idea of, of what the accuracy is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a little similar to the, the 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 saying everyone likes to say about modeling is that all all models are wrong, but most are useful. So I, again, there's a little bit of um, knowing that accuracy into them. Not the same, uh, but yeah, a little bit there. I think we might have, or just remind me of it. Um, might have time for just one more question. Um, and this question is for Leaf, I believe. Um, Jamie Roberts is curious, has any data been gathered with water quality trends in agricultural regions versus cities? And I, I don't know if they're thinking for all of Minnesota for your more uh, urban areas versus agricultural, or, you know, maybe you, you pointed to some of those areas in southern Minnesota in particular, maybe in terms of the trends over time. Yeah, um, that's one of the things we've been looking at. I've, I have about uh, 50 more slides that show a lot of that kind of detail. I wasn't able to go through today, but uh, agricultural areas are, you know, basically decreasing water quality more than urban areas are usually in increasing in water quality. Um, um, the other thing I think there's a zebra mussel question and the zebra mussels are improving the water clarity on some of these lakes. Um, when I looked at the ones that were improving in Minnesota, uh, only three of them had identified zebra mussels, the 3% of them had identified as having gun infested zebra mussels but there is a big you'll you can see a big trend where it's going to go you know the water quality is going to go way up and it's if you see a lake like that it's usually because of zebra mussels or they did some great lake management practices or something yeah absolutely okay great Thank you so much. I am gonna just transition us over. Um, I do, I know we didn't get to all of the questions. Uh, there was a question about links. Uh, so I do wonder, Leaf, if you might be able to include a link in the chat before you hop off to uh, maybe the lake browser or any of your published work that might uh, be about some of this that for folks that are interested. But if you didn't get your question answered today, um, we do want to include um, our speaker, Laura, and Leaf's uh, email for you. If you have a burning question that you didn't get answered, please feel free to reach out to them directly. We know this is just like a touch, uh, a speed networking um, piece of what they're doing. So they go into a lot more detail and have a lot more information um, within their labs and within their groups. 
Um, so thank you all for joining us today. As I mentioned, the recording for today, as well as the PowerPoint slides, will be up on our website, northcentralwater.org, uh, later this week. And we do have two upcoming webinars to make you aware of uh, in February. Next Wednesday, we're going to be talking about baseline assessments for soil health in Ohio. And then at the end of February, we're going to be talking about integrating climate change research and outreach and, and really what uh, social science is saying about uh, communicating uh, about climate change with our friends at the Indiana Illinois Sea Grant. Uh, so with that, I will uh, end the webinar today. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. And Laura and Leif, thank you so much again for your time. Yes, thank you for the invitation.